Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Tinamane Namaste Sharashati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvi Sesa Sanyavari Paschatya Dasatarine So as far as I understand, there's going to be classes on Lord Balaram leading up to Balaram Jayanti. So I was asked to speak on Lord Balaram. Hare Krishna, Hare Rama. You probably noticed that there's Rama in the Maha Mantra. Did you notice? Do you know who that is? What is the Maha Mantra? Is it Balaram? Is it Lord Ram? Is it Radha Raman? Or is it something else? Today, you will find out. Stay tuned. <laughs> Hare Krishna. I can't cover everything in a Less than an hour. We need six hours. But I guess you'll you'll get it. You'll get it in the other classes. Little little. little. What is it, the Pakora? It's, uh, it's born different, like Judah. Yeah. Pakora without the vegetable, just the batter, right? So, there are many things, uh, there are many things about, about Lord Balaram that we could discuss. Because as you know, in the, in the transcendental realm, things are not three-dimensional, and they, their nature is multifaceted. But one of the things we learn about Lord Balaram is he's a manifestation of the existence potency, sat, or sandini potency. That everything 
in Krishna's Leela is manifested from his potency. Radharani manifests the gopis, and Balaram manifests everything, everyone and everything else. In some places it's even said that he manifests Krishna, which is that's for another day. But I'll just throw that seed in your head to confuse you a little bit. Or you can be thinking all day, could he manifest Krishna? How does that work? Um, but <coughs> everything, everyone who exists, is that we all in the material world, every living entity is an expansion of Lord Balaram. If you do the math and you go down, if you make a chart, Lord Balaram expands his Mahasankarshan and then the, the Chaturvyuha and eventually Mahavishnu. And then we all come from Mahavishnu. So our existence came from him. We're dependent on him. And everything in the spiritual world, all, all the paraphernalia, is coming from him, expansion of him. So now we go to the original premise, what does the Maha Mantra mean in relation to Lord Balaram as Sat or Sandini? Well, the Maha Mantra means many things, but because today's Lord Balaram's appearance day, we'll, we'll explain it in this connection. Krishna is Chit, Balaram is Sat, and Radharani is Ananda, or Ladini, Samvit, and Sandini. So that's one of the meanings of Maha Mantra, Samvit, Sandini, Ladini. So Balaram is there. Now, Prabhupada was asked, who is this Balaram, who is the Rama in the Maha Mantra? So this is one explanation, it's the existence potency. The complete spiritual realm, Sarup Shakti, is made of these three elements, and then everything within the spiritual realm is coming from or composed of these three elements. But Prabhupada also said, Lord Ram, and you might say, well, we're not Ram Bhaktas, we're Krishna Bhaktas, so when we chant Hari Ram, would we be thinking of Lord Ram? We might, but generally, no said it also means Balaram, so in this sense, Balaram. And it also means Radha Raman, which means Krishna, the lover of Radha. But then we might ask, well, does Balaram have anything to do with Krishna's conjugal ras? Because the followers of Balaram are in Sakya ras. So Sakya Ras is a Ras which is maybe less prominent in Gaudiya Vaishnavism, but nonetheless, Balaram is the head of that Rasa, Sakya Ras. And if you're in Sakya Ras, don't lament that you didn't make it to Madhurya and commit suicide or something. It is a bona fide Rasa. And, and, um, but Balaram, his position is as friend of Krishna, but in three features. He's Krishna's elder brother, so as elder brother, he's called Dauji, he's respected by Krishna. And so as the elder, he takes the superior position as instructor. And so he's actually Krishna's guru. Balaram, if Balaram's Krishna's guru, then he's also our guru. Balaram is considered the Adi guru, or Kanda guru, the complete manifestation of guru. So he's Krishna's guru, he's our guru also. All gurus are manifestations of Balaram. And he's also Krishna's friend as an equal, and he's also Krishna's junior, because he's not, not that he's junior, he's older, but he serves Krishna, 
he takes the position of subordinate also, so he has these three positions with Krishna. And sometimes protects Krishna, sometimes serves Krishna, sometimes equals as friends, and they play together and do so much mischief together and have fun. Does Lord Balaram take part in Krishna's pastimes with the gopis? Yeah. We're saying Hari Rama. Well, is he does, but not directly, through his consort Anagamanjari. But you may have heard, if uh, or something confusing, perhaps, Lord Balaram. Everything Lord Balaram does is to facilitate the leelas of Krishna. That's just what he does. He's got no independent existence as an enjoyer. He's, everything is for Krishna's service, but he has his own gopis. Right? So that becomes confusing. But it's explained that, that everything he does is just to prepare for Krishna's enjoyment. So his dancing with the gopis was to prepare for Krishna's. I forget exactly how, he, how that happened, but that's the general idea. To prepare for Krishna's enjoyment with the gopis, he... Does anybody know? You, I, I read this. It's always been a question on my mind, and I can't remember the details. So if no one else knows detail, we'll just leave it at that. that that's, um, that's naturally a question that comes up. What's his position with the gopis? It's just like when Balaram was in the womb of Devaki, then he was preparing her womb for Krishna. So that's, he's always preparing. That's his position. He's always assisting in Leela. Now, one thing I think it was important to focus on is in Bhagavatam, Prabhupada talks about Balaram in terms of Bala, strength. Bala hinena labyo. Nayam atma bala hinena, hinena labyo. Without spiritual strength, without Bala, Balaram, we cannot advance in Krishna consciousness. So, Because Balaram Jayanti is coming up, the, one of, I think, the most important meditations is how I can access the mercy of Balaram, that strength by which my obstacles to bhakti can be destroyed. So Balaram can destroy all our obstacles in a fraction of a second. Boom, and they're gone like that. It's not, it's not like, it's a big problem for him. So, and as Balaram represents Guru Tattva, and the, by the mercy of Guru, as Prabhupada said, one, with one kick, I could kick out all maya from your life. If you just follow me, I kick it all out. So Balaram, as the Adi Guru, can kick out all maya, all anarta, all obstacle, everything unwanted. And so, you know, and uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur has rated demons as representing different anartas, and then Krishna kills them. Balaram also kills demons, not just Krishna. He's got his own set of anarthas that he kills, right? Dhenakasura, Palambasura, and so forth. So, there are different, different ideas. Uh, Prabhupada explains the idea that Krishna gives knowledge. So knowledge is important, but knowledge has to be executed. And so we need strength to execute knowledge, right? Just like you hear, doesn't mean you're going to do anything. Doesn't mean you're going to do, even if you want to do something, you may not be able to do it, right? I say, yesterday you should fast and stay, you should stay up all night, don't even take water and stay up all night and chant 64 rounds. And so you might say, hmm, that sounds good. But, and you want to do it, but you need strength to do it. 
So Srila Prabhupada said, knowledge comes from Krishna and strength comes from Balaram. So the knowledge is like the sword. You know that example, sword of knowledge? With the sword of knowledge, so how do you carry the sword? It's heavy. Balaram. You get strength. So I think what would be very helpful for us to do is to, this whole week, be very focused on the mercy of Balaram and be meditating on Balaram in the form of giving us Bala, strength, to overcome whatever it is we need to overcome. And we all have things to overcome. So rather than be very vague and just philosophical, yes, Balaram is the source of strength. That's a tatwa, a fact. But what, <coughs> what do I specifically <coughs> need myself? Where do I apply? You know, it's like someone's massaging you, and they say, where does it hurt? I say, it hurts here. So then they go, they work on that, right? Let's say, well, I'll, I'll massage your whole body, but I need to know where it hurts, and I'll work on that more. So it's, it's like that. Like, where does it hurt? Balaram, where does it hurt? Balaram's asking us, where does it hurt? And you go, oh, it hurts with this. I have this problem. Can you massage that? And the nature of bhakti is, is, is quite interesting. Maybe it's obvious, maybe it's not. But the nature of bhakti is that whatever mess we're in is self-created. And because it's self-created, it can be improved. We can be the ones to improve it. And so as conditioned souls, naturally, we have obstacles. But if we don't do anything, then what happens to the obstacles? They stay, and sometimes they get worse. So. Um, so, in a sense, we could say, the obstacle is my fault. Okay, I'm a conditioned soul, the obstacle's there, but I didn't do anything. I just let it sit there. So, the beauty of bhakti is, you say, Krishna, Balaram, here, it hurts here. Could you massage here? And then they'll, they'll help you. Because, although it, it may not always seem like this, Krishna... He wants to do everything to help us. And we might think, well, if you want to do everything to help us, why did you make the world so difficult? Or as they say, if you want to help us, why did you make women, the brahmacharis will say, why did you make women so attractive if you want us to go back to Godhead? You know, like that, you know, these thoughts come up or whatever. Why did you make this so attractive? You know, you want me to go back to Godhead. But um, it's not that Krishna just left us to drown here. Um, Sisi Radha Govinda Ki Jai. Krishna is saying, Ya, Mayam, this Daviyeshu Gunamayi Mama Maya Yeah, Krishna is saying, Yeah, you're stuck here, pretty much. You know, you don't really have a chance on your own. And so you're a conditioned soul, so naturally, you know, this is your condition. But I'm here to help you. I want you to go back to Godhead more than you do. You don't even care that much. I want you more than you do. And so if you just point out to me where you need help, what you need help with, I'll help you with that. You don't have to, to live with your anarta eternally. I'll help you with that. So Balaram is that power that can annihilate anartha. And so we, we don't want to be ambiguous about it and go, oh yeah, what was the class about? Oh, it was a class about how Balaram annihilates anartha. Yeah, okay, that's good. That's a tattva. But what's your anartha that you need him and to annihilate or help massage and start meditating and praying? Balaram, please help me with this. And you will see by experience that he will help you. And if you don't believe me, test it out and see. That's the only way you're going to know, right? You've got to test it out. You know? But, you know, so who doesn't have 108 or more anarthas to deal with? We all have. Uh, and as you know, sometimes in bhakti you get to a point where you have uh, some problem and you can't figure out how to overcome it. It's, you know, you think you've overcome it and then it comes up through the back door and 
you think you got rid of it 100% and you still see there's 25% left. Do you have that experience? Yeah, you will continually have that experience for quite a while. You know, we get confident. All right, that the north is gone. And then, you know, three years later, it goes, knock, knock, a north are back. Um, so um, the point is, on our own strength, it is very difficult. And so we are dependent on Krishna. And that's, that's the process of bhakti. It's not that I'm just fighting it myself. I'm fighting it in dependence. Uh, I'm approaching it as weak, and I'm depending on my guru, on Mahaprabhu Nityananda, Balaram Krishna. So that's at least this week, it would be a nice, a nice mood just to, to be very, very like, okay, Draupadi, you know, Krishna. This is out of my hands. And you can look at your problems and say, oh, it's just out of my hands, Balaram. I need your help. Only you can give me the strength. Only you have the power to help me with this because on my own, I can't do it. And also, on the appearance day, that's when Balaram's Shakti will be most powerful. So on their appearance day, it's like if you go to India and you go to the place of Leela or the birthplace or the Bhajan Kutir, there's, you can feel their special Shakti there. If you go to Jagannath Puri, it's, it, now it's kind of a problem, but previously at Takaharidas's, um, so I believe it was his Samadhi, Samadhi. They didn't, now they have kirtan. So, but before they didn't have kirtan, you could just go there and chant japa. And you kind of, kind of feel like his shakti is just entered and you just sit there and you like, you can just chant all day. It's like, it's unusual. It's not normal. There's special shakti there because that's where he lived. So on appearance days or disappearance days, there's shakti that we can access. And we, we don't want to let those days go by and not take advantage of that. So I wanted to at least recommend that. Um, I was looking at my computer, and uh, there are many things on it about Lord Balaram, and I don't know where to start. <laughs> but this is a place, uh, maybe I can start with one thing that I found interesting. I can just... Mm. I can find it. Uh, yeah. Oh, there's, there's two prayers. Oh, these are nice prayers. This is from the Skanda Purana. Just now coming. Hare Krishna. Yes. These are two prayers from the Skanda Purana. Namaste to Halagrama. Namaste Mushaya Mushalaya Mushalayuta. Mushalayuta. Namaste Revati Kanta. Namaste Bhakti. Uh, Vatsala. Obeisances to you, O holder of the plow. Obeisances to you, O wielder of the mace. Obeisances to you, O beloved of Revati. Obeisances to you, who are very kind to your devotees. Namaste. Balinam Shrestha Namaste Dharani Dara 
Palambhare namaste tu trahi mam krishna purvaja. I offer my respectful obeisances unto Lord Balaram, the best of the strong and the support of the earth. Obeisances unto you, O enemy of Palamba. Please deliver me, O elder brother of Krishna. What is the uh, plan this week? Is there like topics for each speaker or are there just they're going to choose their own topic and they're each going to speak about Balaram? Because I don't want to... Are you talking about the class in general? Yeah, I mean, tomorrow, this, this week you're going to have classes on Balaram? Yeah, so they choose their own topic. Oh, they choose their own topic. Okay. If I knew what they were going to choose then I wouldn't talk about it and I don't... I guess, anyway. Um... I, I I think uh, um, one topic is just very interesting. It's Lord Balaram's relationship with Duryodhan. It's quite an interesting topic. Like why? And and um, we have a disciple of Prabhupada, and his name is Duryodhan Guru. And that's the name of Balaram because Balaram was actually. The f he taught Duryodhan how to fight. So he's Duryodhan Guru. He taught Bhima how to fight also. And when Bhima and Duryodhan were fighting, Balaram, like he had affection for both, he couldn't watch it. Can you imagine, you know? You have like two sons and they're in a boxing match. You, you can't watch it because somebody's going to get hurt or they're both going to get hurt. Anyway, um, so, the problem was, um, as, as we know, this is really interesting. It is said that Balaram, uh, Duryodhan accepted Balaram as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but he didn't accept Krishna, as we know. He didn't like Krishna, and he didn't like the Pandavas. And there's a backstory, as there's always a backstory. You know, like, the backstory is who were they? Who really are they? Who were they in the last life? Who were they in the many last lives? Why is he so angry and envious? And why even he tried to um, What did, what did Duryodhan try to do? He tried to grab, capture Krishna, and Krishna manifested as the, as the Vishwarupa, so he couldn't grab him. Um, he, Krishna couldn't negotiate with him at all. He was set on uh, turning against the Pandavas, trying to destroy them. I mean, that's like, I mean, once, one thing to offend devotees, but to try to kill them, this is bad. The back story is he's an Amsa, he's a, a part of Kali. So, you know, you got to feel sorry for him a little bit. <laughs> Couldn't help himself. But anyway, somehow he accepted Balaram. Um, yeah. He became a disciple of Balaram. Now, this is interesting. I'll have to read some things for you. Hmm. Um, and, you know, Sometimes gurus have affection for their disciples, even maybe when the disciples are not so great. That's so. Balaram had affection for his disciple, Duryodhan. And he, as you know, he wanted, what did he want? Uh, his Subhadra to marry Duryodhan. Um, okay, so now uh, the Acharyas have analyzed this. Uh, this is interesting. Um, Mm. Um, yes. I'm going to read some things, how this is reconciled, because I don't want to, I want to make sure we get it straight. First point, point number one. It's not easy to see who is really close to Guru. 
because it looked like Duryodhan is very close to Balaram, like he's a, a disciple and close and so forth. By a paravichar, a parent consideration, it appeared that both Banasura and Ravan pleased Shiva and got his mercy. But our acharyas have described that they only got shakapata kripa, mercy with cheating. Now, the mercy with cheating is they didn't get real mercy. They got material benefit. They got some wealth. They got some fame. They got some position. But they didn't get the pure mercy, Krishna prema. So what's the point? It's like, OK, I have a guru, but what do I want from the guru? Do I want Maya or do I want Krishna? So it looks like, oh, such and such is such a great devotee. But sometimes it looks like they're great because their motive is very strong, but it's not pure. So Durya don't look like a great devotee, but what was his motive? He, his motives were material. Secondly, so we got the first one. You're going to remember this? You'll be tested on this on Wednesday. If you don't pass, you don't get prasadam. OK. Secondly, this is really weird, as you already re must have recognized. Jirodhan has faith in Balaram and not in Krishna, right? Or some have faith in Krishna and not Mahaprabhu, right? Not good. Um, he didn't have faith in Krishna, and he didn't have faith in the Pandavas. Sometimes a disciple may be full of enthusiasm, utsahan mai, full of enthusiasm for his or her guru, but may neglect or offend other Vaishnavas. Have you seen that before? Or like Duryodhan, some disciples may express devotion for their guru, but they may not be interested in worshiping Krishna or chanting Krishna Nam. I don't think that's common in Iskand. But um, what's common in Iskand is devotion to one's guru at the expense of sometimes offending another devotee. We've seen that, right? Or neglecting, neglecting to honor another devotee. Um, you know, that, that phenomenon we see sometimes that I only hear from my Diksha guru, I don't hear from anyone else. So you only see those devotees when their Diksha Guru comes, and when he leaves, you never see them. So it's, it's, it's not perfect. It's just, you got to do better than that. Um, um, although it may appear that such devotees are very close to their Guru, and they may even get some big position, they do not get the same quality of mercy that a surrendered disciple receives. Lesson three. We must understand Duryodhan's identity. So here it comes. The, you're wondering about this Kali. Where is it? Now you're going to find out. Garga Samhita 1530 describes him as an angsa, a material, a, excuse me, a partial expansion of Kali. Duryodhana Kaler Angso. There you go. There's the evidence. Although externally he looked like a big follower of his guru, Duryodhana was a servant and follower of Kali, not his guru, Lord Balaram. He had his own agenda, separate from the Lord, an agenda that ultimately caused pain and death for millions of persons. Now, there's a song by Bhaktivedanta Thakur. You may have heard this song. He talks about disciples. Not disciples of their guru, although they look like they are, but disciples of Kali, known as Kali Chela. Here is the song. Eoto eka kalir chela. Mata Neda Kapni 
भरत तिलक नायके गोलाय माला Here is a disciple of Kali Yuga. He has a shaved head. Wears copans. Marks his forehead with tilak and keeps tulsi beads around his neck. In other words, what you see is not what you get. You see a Vaishnava, but inside you get something else. And so, you all know the definition of, of pure bhakti is service which has no motive. So obviously the definition of impure bhakti, which we're describing here, is service which is motivated by something personal that we're trying to get from the guru. As Prabhupada said, in his own life, he wanted nothing from his guru. And because he wanted nothing, he got the best thing, which was the power of his guru to give Krishna to others. And he said, but other disciples, they wanted the property and they fought for the temples. And so they got the property, but they didn't get the shakti. Krishna shakti vina nahitara pavartana. They didn't get that. And that's what Prabhupada had. So he could spread Krishna consciousness. So that's what's being explained here. Mm. That's it. There's only three. Okay. Mm. If you're interested in reading what I just read, it's from the latest... No, it's not the latest, but it's a Katamrita. And the whole issue is dedicated to Lord Balaram. Okay. You know what issue it is? It is issue number. Five, five, five. Look at this picture. Oh my God, this is amazing. Can you see it? You know, babies are cute, right? Young kids are cute. Like, can you imagine how cute Krishna Balaram are? I don't think so. But well, this picture gives you some idea, but. Hare Krishna. Um, I thought I could read something interesting. I don't know who wrote this, unfortunately, and we could discuss this. I, I was just searching. I collect things on my computer and forget about them after I collect them. Do you have that problem? Collect information, and you know, when you have to give a class, you look on your computer and go, oh, look at this. I forgot I had it. This is entitled, Four Secrets Why Krishna Balaram Deities Came to Vrindavan. I thought that would be interesting to discuss. Mm. So here's a quote from Prabhupada. It's quite interesting. <clears throat> Before I, I read this, maybe you all don't know, but when the Krishna Balaram Mandir was established in 1975. Raman Reti was, <clears throat> it was very rural and very much out of the way. You know, the main temples of Vrindavan, where they are, this was like there was nothing there. It was just farmland. And, you know, you've all been there and you've gone from there into Lohi Bazaar and so forth. So, so at that time in 75, that devotees were questioning, would anybody come here? It's so out of the way. Of course, Vrindavan now has grown, but then it was out of the way. And so there, was, there were doubts that we should have a temple so far out of the way. So look what Prabhupada said about that. Just like in our Vrindavan temple, we don't advertise. 
people are coming by thousands. I thought, it's so long a distance from the city, nobody will come. But Balaram is so powerful, he's bringing. Come out here. Laughter. Otherwise, I was, what is that? Plowing, Jamuna was threatened. So um, I think Prabhupada was kind of saying Balaram with his plow is bringing people to the Krishna Balaram temple. Um, now I'm reminded of, of uh, an example or an analogy of Balaram's plow. So the guru plants the seed, or Krishna plants the seed. Now, these are all analogies, of course, the seed of bhakti. But you all know that when you plant a seed, if the soil is not fertile, it, the seed can't grow. It doesn't matter if the seed is strong. So Balaram, with his plow, he cultivates the heart, pulls the weeds out, turns the soil around, so that when Krishna plants the seed, as we said earlier, the seed of knowledge, it can grow. So we need Balaram Guru's mercy for that. Um, So reason number one, you may agree or disagree, and we can discuss. Reason one, Prabhupada chose Krishna and Balaram as presiding deities because most of the Vrindavan temples were of Radha and Krishna. Iskand's temple would be unique, Krishna Balaram. Now, some people say, and I don't think it's listed here, Reason number five, that Prabhupada is a cowherd boy, and therefore he established Krishna Balram. But there's no Siddhanta, that is a discussion point, but it's an interesting discussion. But you've heard that before? He's in Madhurya Ras, he doesn't like to hear that. So reason two. Iskan land was located in Raman Reti, an area of forest and soft sands where Krishna and Balaram had enjoyed their childhood pastimes 5,000 years ago. To celebrate and worship the youthful sports of Krishna and Balaram in Raman Reti, Raman Reti was fitting. According to Bhagavatam, the playing of the coward boys with Krishna and Balaram as friends in Vrindavan is the highest spiritual realization, far beyond ordinary religionist understanding of God. The supreme truth, who some meditated upon as impersonal Brahman, others worshipped as the supreme Almighty, still others considered an ordinary living entity, was the eternal loving friend of the coward boys of Vrindavan. Only after many lifetimes of pious activities had they become eligible to join in the loving pastimes of Krishna and Balaram in Raman Reti. So if you've been to Vrindavan and you go on the Prikram Marg, you will stop and everyone will say, hey, see this tree? This is where Krishna and Balaram played. And I always think, is that the only place they played here? You know? But anyway, it's a, it's a landmark, I guess. So that's another reason. That's Krishna Balaram's place. Um, mm, and here's an interesting reason. Although Prabhupada was introducing his disciples to Vrindavan, he was also introducing the residents of Vrindavan to his disciples. Uh, his group was already encountering some of the same attitudes Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati and his party of pilgrims had met in 1932. People's refusal to accept low-born persons as Vaishnavas. Prabhupada trusted, however, that if his disciples could construct a wonderful temple for Krishna and Balaram, the hearts of the Vrindavan residents would change and they would accept his disciples. He tolerated the roughness and slowness of his disciples and when Vrindavan residents came to see him, he humbly requested they overlook his disciples' faults and recognize them as genuine devotees of Krishna. After all, they had given up a sinful life and were regular, regularly chanting the holy names of Krishna. I don't know. I don't know how that explains why he established Balaram.
Hmm. I think just saying that that would attract people to the temple. And so when people come to the temple, they would see the devotees and they would gain faith that these are real Vaishnavas. And reason number four. There was another specific significance in Prabhupada's choosing Krishna and Balaram as the central object of worship in his Vrindavan temple. Lord Balaram is the first expansion from Lord Krishna, and in his incarnation of Sankarshan, he upholds all the universes. The Vaishnavas therefore worship Balaram for spiritual strength. Prabhupada said, you can pray to Lord Balaram, Prabhupada said, to help you in your deficiency. As the source of spiritual strength, Lord Balaram is also known as the original spiritual master. So we have discussed that. And now this sign says, I'm supposed to stop at 850 and ask for, I never follow signs, but I might as well do something different. End lecture by 850 and questions and answers till 9. Okay. Not just questions and answers, comments, additions. Yes. Give the mic to the Brajbasi. He's going to tell us something about Krishna Balaram. Thank you, Mahal. Uh, it's described in the Lila Amrita, Prabhupada's thinking, that most devotees, they worship Radha and Krishna, but to teach the Bridget Bhasis and people in general that the way to Radha and Krishna is through the mercy of Gorni Thai, and Gorni Thai have reincarnated previously, they were Krishna and Balaram, so hence the Krishna Balaram Mandir, and Prabhupada set up the um, way of the temple that you come in on the left side, and you see the spiritual master, Guru, then immediately Gauranga, then Krishna Balaram Center, and finally Radha and Shamasundar and their attendants will lead to the shop. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, I'd like to maybe add a comment from your class from last night. Mm -hmm. There's a very nice um, sentence or two Prabhupada in a purport in the eighth canto where he says, I can find it with the reference, but I don't have it in my head right here, that it's not that Krishna is only pleased with his topmost devotees, he's pleased with all of his devotees. Mm. And if the devotees are sincere in continuing their devotional practices, then he will give them all intelligence to come back home, back to God's head. Beautiful. Hare Krishna. You know, um, another thing about Krishna being pleased, we have this verse in uh, third canto, who Krishna gave the position of mother and liber you know, eternally mother to Putana, therefore who else should I worship? Aho bhakti yam stanakalakutam, that verse. Who well, you know, so somebody comes to kill Krishna, but offers what seems to be the action of a mother, and Krishna says, okay, you can be eternally my mother. What to speak of a devotee who's sincerely trying to serve Krishna? So we might think, you know, how can I please Krishna? And here Putana is pleasing him, and she's trying to kill him what to speak of a devotee who's trying to serve. So we should never think that Krishna doesn't appreciate it. Yes? I had a question about, you know, play, praying to Lord Balaram for strength. Yes. To remove an now, I want to hear from you. What about, you know, you may be, one, one may be praying for the Anartha to be removed, but not really sincerely desiring for it to really go away, you know, still want yeah. to enjoy yeah. that in <laughs> <laughs> What happens then? Uh, not much. <laughs> because yeyatamam prapadyante, you know, when we have a problem and it's not going away, we have to be honest because we don't want it to go away. 
you know. It's like, Krishna, why aren't you taking this away? And Krishna's saying, why don't you let me take it away? You're, you're interfering because I'm not, I'm only going to reciprocate with your desire. And if you want to keep grabbing onto it while I'm pulling it away, you're getting, you're interfering with my job. So you decide what you want. So in that case, then we pray to have the desire to let it go. We pray to remove the fear of, of holding on to that. I won't be something, will be not stable or I won't be happy if this goes. Or pray that how can I use this attachment? If I can't give it up, maybe I'm not ready. Maybe it's premature. That's why I can't give it up. So how can I use this attachment in a way that it's, it won't hinder my bhakti? Or even in a way that I could employ it in my bhakti? But, um, you know, Prabhupada said, we should really pray, Krishna, you know, whatever you need to do, do it. That's where we, where, that's where we want to come to if we're not there yet. Krishna, whatever, whatever is necessary, then just do it. So it's like, you know, the question we have to ask ourselves is, well, what do I want? What really do I want? Do I really want to stay here? Do I really want to hold on to something that I know is just uh, going to only be problematic for me and ultimately cause my misery? And so sometimes we need to connect like deeper, like get through the surface of, oh, I want this and that, and you don't really want it. And ask yourself, what do I really want? What's really important? And that might inspire you to be able to pray without fear, because you'll realize this is really what I want. And this other stuff is just bubbles on the water. Maya is just bubbling up. But below the surface, I know what my, I want. And it's, that's really, it's really a good exercise. It's like we're digging deeper. You know, go down to that, you know, what was that, what was that desire there when I became a devotee? Like, where is that? Let me connect with that, because when I connect with that, then I can tell myself, this is what I want. I don't want this other. And, and sometimes, sometimes you just have to tell yourself, this other thing, I don't really want it. And what I really want is this, because then it, it directs your consciousness, because you're affirming it. Like, I want this, I don't want this. Affirmation, affirmation. Um, it helps. You know, like, we have this tradition, which some people might think is kind of strange, talking to yourself, talking to your mind, trying to reason with yourself. But really what you're doing is you're just asserting what is most important for you, and you're asserting the truth. This is real, this is what I want, this is what my guru is guiding me towards. Am I such a fool to turn my back on his instruction? And then you realize, no, I don't really want that. I don't want to disobey. I don't, and so you tell yourself, I don't want that. It just seems like I want it, but I don't. And I seem to be afraid of this other desire, but really I'm not, this is really what I want. And so by asserting it, confirming it, you'll see that it can change can change your whole attitude towards it. Because there's a power, there's power in making those assertions. They're like, my dear mind, I don't want this. I want, my dear mind, go to the feet of Krishna. You've done all this, you don't do it anymore. It's very powerful. Because otherwise, maya works with, with ignorance. As long as we, we don't assert what is our real desire, then she'll just convince us we're not qualified for that, or we don't really want it, or, or whatever. But when you assert it, it you'll see it. It affects you differently. Like, and it's so easy. Just say it. I want this. Just saying it, I want this, is very powerful. And it's almost like you're asserting it to the universe. I want Krishna. I don't want Maya. And be specific about what it is you want, what it is you don't want. See if it helps. I, I, I feel often we don't do this enough. Like we get disconnected from what is most important. And when we're disconnected from what's most important, Maya comes in and says, okay, I'll give you something that's that you'll think is important. 
and we'll go running after it. And at some point in our frustration, we look back and we think, well, why was I doing that? that? I don't even want that. But we lost connection with what we deeply wanted. Because that's, that's Maya's job, to help us lose connection with what's most important. And so, you know, it's like, it's like an emotional connection. You've got to feel it a little bit, you know. What is, what is really in my heart deeply that I want? And it's not that difficult to do. We're chanting every day, so it's there. And when you chant, you can connect with it very deeply and pray. You know, that, that desire strengthens. And um, it works. I've tested it. It's very important. Otherwise, how could somebody be doing so well in bhakti and then all of a sudden just they're gone. They disconnected from that desire. They let Maya disconnect them. Does that make sense? You want to try it? See what happens. Everybody should do this. Even if, even if you have, like, let's say, like difficulty getting up in the morning and you really want to get up early, you just state it. I want to get up early. I don't want to get up late. I want to get up early. It has an effect because the, the, you know, the mind is the steering wheel, basically. And if we don't know, learn how to deal with our mind, it's just going to steer itself. So it's very important to understand how the mind works and get a handle on it. And th these are simple things you can do just to make a determination. This is what I'm going to do. Yes. I guess there's only 20 seconds, so maybe a quick answer, but you were mentioning that budget by Bhakti of Thakur and the reality that there may be Kali Chalas. How do we not become paranoid? How do we not get taken advantage of what to do? Like how we don't become a Kali Chela? Yeah, and yeah. Oh. Oh, somebody, another Kali Chela is taking advantage of you. Well, this, uh, this verse is really interesting because I started thinking about this and I'm thinking this verse is very, could be potentially be dangerous because now I'm looking, after you hear the verse, you go, well, who's the Kali Chela in the temple here? You know, so, and you, we each have our list, you know, I think it's so and so, yeah. And so pretty much every devotee is being offended, you know, so... Um, When somebody is trying to exploit the Krishna conscious movement, that's Kali, fully empowering them. That's how we know what it means to be a Kali Chela. They're not here to serve sincerely. They're here, they're here to get something. Some position, or, or, or could be wealth, recognition, that's, that's the prime motive. And so externally they play the part, but internally the motive is to gain something material. And so in bhakti, everything is about motive. The how you define pure bhakti, impure bhakti, is based on motive, not necessarily action, because action, we're all doing the same thing anyway, but why are we doing it? That's the real thing. And you know, it's better, even sometimes we make mistakes, but it's better we make a mistake for the right reason than do everything perfectly for the wrong reason. I'm doing it perfectly because I want to get the recognition. So the whole motive spoiled it. Because it's a relationship. It's not like this is some mechanical process. It's a relationship. We're trying to please Krishna. We're not trying to get something material. And so, and Prabhupada, we need to protect the movement from people who have their own agenda. And there, there, there are times when Prabhupada was very, very um, concerned about people in ISKCON having their own agenda and using ISKCON. Because Prabhupada's mood was everything for Krishna. Not even, you know, even wasting one cent, some, one cent sometimes Prabhupada was concerned. That every you know that nobody takes advantage of the resources of his kind. What to speak of, you know, we we might do that unconsciously or 
uh, not purposely, but to speak of doing it purposely. So it, there couldn't be anything further from pure bhakti. And Prabhupada established ISKCON as a movement of pure bhakti. So if we lose pure bhakti, there's no need to continue the movement because then you're spreading impure bhakti, and that wasn't why he came. So now we're part of the movement, and he wants to spread pure bhakti, so we have to be pure bhaktas to represent what he wanted to spread, and then ISKCON remains pure, and if it's not pure, we have nothing to give people. You know, there's a, I think there's a letter, Prabhupada said, you know, there are better managers, there are better speakers, there are better this and that, but our strength is our purity. That's where, we, you know, we're not going to outdo people materially. We're, we're not so great materially. You probably noticed that, right? But what we're great at is, well, at least we need to be great at, is being pure. That's our big advantage. So that's important. So that's how we know Kali Chela. It's by the motive. You know, you know how there's, there's a saying, I think Chana Kapana, it says like one bad disciple could, one bad disciple could despoil a whole institution or one bad son can spoil the family, something like that. So, you know, Prabhupada was concerned because he saw it in Gaudiya Mutt. So um, we're fortunate because we're the next generation. So we like, here, this is what not to do. So Prabhupada always taught us, don't do this. This happened in our Instagodium mouth. Don't do this. Not that we shouldn't do the good things, but the bad things, don't do it. And that was, you know, personal motivation. They wanted the property, not the, not the mercy. Hare Krishna. So, everyone, become a pure devotee. You have three days to practice. By Balaram's appearance day, all impurity destroyed. Now, I have to say something else, because this, this is easily misunderstood. Becoming a pure devotee, as you know, there's a process. And you go through stages, step by step. This is Kali Yuga. Those stages are slow. Uh, we're born in the West. It's 2023. Things are tough. A few hundred years ago, people would go through those stages in a few months, from Shraddha to Prema. You know, it was just like boom, boom, boom. You know, pure chanting, 64 rounds. You know, it was a different, <laughs> different time. And so a lot of us are hopeful that we'll go through it very quickly, and we don't. And, it, and it's, that's not a problem. You think, I don't have love of God. How will I get it? It's not a problem. If we're sincere and we follow the process and we try our best, that's, that's perfect. That's all we can do. And you don't have to worry about, am I here, 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 here? Because if you sincerely try your best, you will go up. It's guaranteed you'll be there. You will get it. And, and whatever gap there is that you're missing, Prabhupada's mercy will fill in that gap. So otherwise, we, be, we could become quite distraught that, well, you know, so many years and I'm still, I don't have love for Krishna. What's happening? What's going on? Of course, it's a, it's a concern for sure, but not such a concern that we think necessarily I'm doing anything wrong. You may not be. You may be doing everything right. We're just very conditioned and it takes time. And I think one problem I see, not that I think, I see that we get our timeline wrong. So we think, you know, I'm taking the train to the Bhakti Center, and I think the train's going to take three minutes. It doesn't. And I'm like, what, what's going on here? Why is, you know, so we think the timeline to pure bhakti, when you're a younger devotee at least, you think it's going to happen much faster, and then you can get quite frustrated when you realize it doesn't happen. What do you speak? Have you been around 50 years? It's like, oh, 50 years and it's not happening. But... It's just normal for a conditioned soul. It's not like, you know, there's one devotee. He wrote Prabhupada a letter and he said, you know, I fell down. And Prabhupada read the letter and laughed. And everybody was surprised. Prabhupada, why are you laughing? He said, he said he's just a young devotee. Of course he falls down. You know, it's like a kid trying to walk. You know, it's, it's not unusual, right? That we have difficulty. 
But Prabhupada's point was, well, you just stay on the path, everything's good. You'll slip up and down, whatever, but that's just normal. You just continue. So sincere, without all ulterior motives, then everything's good. And wherever you are on the timeline, it's, it's okay. I want to be further along, obviously, but I am who I am. It's just real. And, you know, pain comes from not accepting reality, doesn't it? You know, I want to be here, but I'm here, and I can't accept that I'm here, and, I want to, and I'm just, like, lamenting. This space causes all kinds of lamentation. But, you know, no, this is who I am. And when you accept who you are, then it's a lot easier. And then you can improve on that, that version of yourself. Yeah. Okay, time's up. You had something? No, no. Any? Okay. I'm famous for going over time. I've gone an hour and a half over time in some places. But <clears throat> I don't want to become famous here for doing that. They may, you may never invite me back. So we'll end class now. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Go Premanand.